Thank you, and may it please the court. Um, we are here today on an appeal from a summary judgment entered in a foreclosure case. Um, our primary focus of our appeal is that we contend that my clients raised issues of fact about the authenticity of the note, supported by an affidavit, that more than just simply said, I, I think that's not my note, or I don't think that's the original note, but gave, in this case, my client did work as in the printing industry and had some background on it, raised those issues up in the affidavit, pointed out discrepancies in the signature itself, which was the basis of his affidavit, which at least at that point triggered an issue of fact. He doesn't dispute that that's a true and accurate copy of He does not dispute that it's a true and accurate copy. He just disputes that it's the original document, which is what the plaintiff was contending and which is required um, as this was not a lost note count. But he equivocated a little bit in the affidavit, and, and given that, doesn't the court have the right to interpret the affidavit as the court reads it and sees it? Well, to the extent he equivocated, yes, but I don't think he, equiv he equivocated only in so much as saying, I looked at it, and that looks not, that's not my signature, but it looks like a photostatic copy. If it's a photostatic copy, it by definition cannot be the original. Now, if he's saying, equivocate, yeah, did I sign a note that looked just like that? Is that a great copy? Well, didn't he say something like, I don't remember his exact words, didn't he say, I believe, or some sort of less than absolute qualifier? He believed it was a photostatic copy, but I think he also said that he, he absolutely affirmed it was not the note itself. So it could have been, again, a forgery does not have to be a photostatic copy. And then, of course, his, his, those are self-serving, of course. I mean, no disrespect by that comment, but you can't look at a party's position like that and not come to that sort of possibility. And then there was some indication he had some printing expertise, but really no elaboration on what that was or why that should factor in or give him some credibility beyond any other party who would take a position that would be advantageous to them. <clears throat> well, I would respond to that in so much as he's the only witness to the signing of the note that was in that room. So, who better than a party that was actually at a signing? And that's kind of a fundamental issue with all of these note cases. Everyone at a signing is an expert on whether something is an original or a copy and knows that, that a note loses indentation or doesn't lose indentation within five years? I would say he could, I can better remember what pen I used at the signing of my closing, whereas the attorneys who may show up later could not, it, by any definition. How does he's not alleging this is a forgery? He's alleging it's a copy. He's alleging it's a copy. Yes. However, that becomes a fundamental issue when it's being put forward as the original. And was there an evidentiary hearing on this after the affidavit was filed? Well, that's another issue, which was there was first a summary judgment hearing where the court passed and punted and said that seems to be an issue of fact. Right. Now, I don't understand and how Florida law has never espoused the idea that you can go back and have an evidentiary hearing to end run the purpose of a trial, which typically when you find an, if, an issue of evidence. You can't have a, a limited evidentiary hearing on, on a, a narrow issue? I would believe that, that traditionally that's been used to allow further discovery or further inquiries or simply to establish a prima facie case for going on, say, uh, punitive damages. In this case, in any other case, this court has ruled, such as in, the, uh, in prior foreclosure cases, that where the, a judge, in this case the summary judge, the true summary judgment judge, says that there's an issue of fact here, that's what triggers the necessity for a trial. Why does it trigger the necessity for a trial? So that both parties can thoroughly vet the evidence put before them. See, what are they going to, put, you know, if you but want to depose was, the witnesses. Was this or was this not noticed for an evidentiary hearing after the, the, the summary judgment was put, put off? It was. It was. And your client attended, and what did he say under oath? Actually, I'm not sure my client attended. I'm, I'm not sure your client attended either. I think the answer is he didn't show. He didn't show, but we still have the affidavit before the court, and that kind of goes to the second part of our argument. Which well, do is, affidavits trump an evidentiary hearing? Do you have the right, once you file an affidavit, just not to come to trial? But there wasn't a trial, Your Honor. Was there an evidentiary hearing? There was an evidentiary hearing, but not under the same scrutinies and requirements of a trial. And so I would say 
And for that matter, the same witness who signed the affidavit that the plaintiffs are relying on to overcome, which the court admittedly did not even, by its own words, supposedly consider. Right. Now, as a practical matter, it's been you know, five, six years since he paid a, a, a mortgage note on this, and it, there's like nobody else who owns this note that's come forward with a note saying, hey, I want to get paid, right? At this point, yes, Your Honor. I mean, I, I have no evidence to say there's been somebody so else going around. The risk of double liability on this, if this is a photocopy, <laughs> doesn't stand out to me, at least. Well, if somebody else does show up, though, he could still be liable for that note, the original. Well, in light of everything that's in this record, I think the bank could pretty well be on the hook on that, don't you? I'm not sure that, I mean, Florida Supreme Court has not overcome that 1920s decision that said, <coughs> no, that is the homeowner's responsibility <coughs> to make sure and contest if they don't believe the notes are there, which our client's done here. Now, as much as it may sound like a technicality, we did raise issues, and one of the reasons the judge didn't go into hearing the other, per the other side's uh, affidavits was because there was no supporting documents to their affidavits to overcome my client's factual statement. Now, the court may take issue as to whether or not it's truly factual, but it did raise no different than if someone stood up and sworn her oath that didn't happen, this happened. Summary judgment standard requires that at that point, and this Bishop v. City of Clearwater exemplifies that, even if a judge ultimately thinks he's not going to believe this statement later on, he's supposed to deny summary judgment and then move forward to trial, where the true arena for contesting facts as opposed to a summary judgment. Personally, I think if the plaintiff truly wanted to attack this, at the summary judgment level, they would have been required to depose my client, find the basis of his answer, get it down solid, and then put that, his own statements against him. They failed to do that. I'm not sure it would have changed the, our, our argument, which is he would still be contesting that there's an issue of fact. But traditionally, in personal injury cases, where we have an expert that says it all happened the way it happened, courts say, well, that's really nice. <coughs> You're still going to trial. If we have a case where one person says, I was crossing the road, the other person says, you were not, it goes to trial. And in this particular case, at the last minute, they stood forward and after, we put forward with notice our affidavit. It survived at the initial summary judgment hearing. I believe the, or the order at that point to require some evidentiary hearing was an error. The point is, at that point, the court should have said, at this point, you've not overcome, there's an issue of fact, go to trial. Then, following that, the plaintiff should have either attacked the evidence or gone forward to trial where the judge would have had a, cl a clear light to make the decisions he ultimately makes. Was an objection to the evidentiary hearing made at the beginning of the evidentiary hearing? No, Your Honor. Okay. Well, there was an objection. I did. Actually, in the hearing, I did object, stating that this, that this matter was supposed to go with better served at trial, and this was an end run attempt at trying to get around the summary judgment rule. Several times I repeated that we had not been given a chance to even vet the witnesses because they have an affidavit, they have no supporting documents. They show up with a different person to testify, which we at the last minute. So we, it's a, for lack of a better term, a typical foreclosure situation where we have an amorphous party that seems to plug and play people as they want to at the last minute. And I understand that they have reasons for that that are not insidious in nature. They have people that have to be in different places, not everyone's always available. I, I get that, however, as a fundamental issue, it was the wrong arena for the court to make this decision. The court would have been better served to simply say, you know what, we'll have a trial in 30 days, go to your witness depositions, and you're done. They chose not to do that, and in so doing, again, did not follow the law, which will ultimately leave a question mark on this case. All we were asking for was the chance to, A, go to trial under the normal auspices of a trial, with the facts raised. Case law in Florida clearly supports our position, as has this court in its past rulings against summary judgments, where there's been an issue of fact raised. Now, I will say, yes, if someone simply goes out there and says, I don't think that's my note, or that's not my note, without more, that, as courts have ruled, would not be sufficient. But when they say a bit more, when they give some basis to their belief, and they point to something in that note, or in that, the chain of title, or chain of facts, that's different, that scintilla should be enough to trigger denial of summary judgment. 
It doesn't deny recourse. It doesn't deny redress. It just requires the plaintiffs to actually do their job like they should have done from the beginning. And even by that basis, the plaintiff did not overcome. In many cases, once you raised the issue of fact, the plaintiff could have overcome it. Here, they didn't even come up with an affidavit that would have been admissible evidence to overcome it because it's the, again, opinion testimony of an employee of the <coughs> prior uh, processing law firm stating that, I know it's real because someone mailed me this document that said it was original. So it's his opinion based on documents that he supposedly read. Actually, not, not even his opinion or her opinion. Their opinion based on notes read by somebody else who took in the thing several years ago, which they failed to attach any of those notes to even see what was put down. So I would argue that there's been no admissible evidence that the plaintiff even had the original note, just a notice of filing. We raised the issue in the affirmative defense. At that point, they should have put forward something more than just simply, well, we filed it because our client gave it to us. And I'll put forward it wasn't World Savings Bank, but rather Wells Fargo operating on behalf of World Savings Bank. So there's a bit of a gap between party and servicer and holder. So a lot of the same issues that this court's had at least troubles with or concerns with in the past were in this case. There was an affidavit, sworn under penalty of perjury, I might add. So, I mean, this is more than just an unsworn statement or some statement in an affirmative defense hoping to avoid a summary judgment. My client went to the risk of putting his neck out for this. So, unless okay. the court has any other questions, I'll reserve for the... I'll answer my time. Ms. Tomasi. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Marie Tomasi for the uh, Bank Wells Fargo now, uh, earlier World Savings in Wachovia. The only issue before the court today, is, as the court seems well aware, is whether there was a genuine issue of material fact regarding whether that note was an original. And the burden, of course, was on the defendant to raise a genuine issue of material fact to preclude summary judgment on this issue because the note is presumed to be sufficient on its face uh, once it was filed. So the, def the defendants filed the affidavit of Mr. Casper. And Mr. Casper doesn't say, uh, this is a copy. He says, it appears to be a copy. Uh, he has a self-serving conclusory affidavit. He that says, does it is not the original note that I signed. Correct. That's, does that's start smarter out than it appears to be a copy. Yes, Your Honor. It does start out with the conclusory statement. This is, and, I, and I'll read you the actual. It is not the original note that I signed. And then he says, specifically, and I'm quoting, it appears to be a color photostatic copy. Also, the signature lacks any indication. So the two reasons why he says this is not the original is it appears to be a copy, and I don't feel an indentation behind the signature. So those are both, of course, um, equivocating statements, to borrow the court's word, because he doesn't say it is a copy. And he does reference his experience in the printing industry. He says, um, based on my experience, or my work, excuse me, my quote, my work in the printing industry, this appears to be a copy. So the question before the trial court was whether this was sufficient to shift the burden to the bank to prove that this was the original note. And the court found that it was an insufficient, um, it was insufficient to raise a genuine issue of material fact as to whether the note was original. Nevertheless, there was an evidentiary hearing set. And tell us about that, what, what went on in that evidentiary hearing? Well, it was duly noticed counsel for both parties attended. Counsel for the bank brought a witness live to attest to the fact that this was an original note. Uh, but Mr. Casper did not attend the hearing and did not testify. So uh, there was a discussion among counsel and, and the judge there were some uh, argument and questions that the court raised with counsel, um, but ultimately the court concluded that the affidavit itself was insufficient to raise a genuine issue of material fact because it failed to give any information 
um, about Mr. Casper's experience in the printing industry, and it uh, equivocates in saying that it appears to be a copy, and uh, therefore it was insufficient. Even had the court gone forward, however, counsel for the defendants had candidly admitted that his client, Mr. Casper, was not there to testify. Affidavits are not evidence, of course, and the bank had no burden to put on its witness absent the, the defendant testifying to support his was affidavit. Was that witness put on? No, a, the, a proffer was made. The, okay. the, the court asked um, counsel for the bank to make a proffer, so he began making a proffer. He was interrupted during the proffer and never completed it, but in his partial proffer, he said that she would have testified, uh, the, the, the witness that was there would have testified uh, that she handled the intake of these documents, had reviewed thousands of original notes, and was prepared to say that this was that what was in the court file was an original. So but was this someone with the bank or someone with the other law firm? With the other law firm, Your Honor, Cass Schuler. Uh, the bank also submitted two affidavits in support of its summary judgment motion that went to this issue. Um, the affidavit of Michael Dolan, which actually was submitted with the motion for summary judgment and covered all of the bases that you typically see in a supporting affidavit, including at, um, I just want to check and make sure I give you the right site, but I believe it's paragraph 14. Yes, paragraph 14 of his affidavit um, documented the process for the receipt by the bank of original notes and the storage of those notes in a locked vault in Texas from where they are retrieved through a system that requires them to be checked out and the checking out logged in and that he could track what had happened with the original and could track that it was sent to Cass Schuler. And then the, the law firm that had the case before, Trenum Kemker. And then um, the affidavit of an employee of Cass Schuler who testified that they received it, they kept it until they filed it in the court file on the date of filing in March of 2010. So even, even back in the earlier stages of this proceeding, the bank supported what happened, sort of the chain of custody, if you will, with the original note, uh, which it wasn't required to do because the affidavit of, of Mr. Casper was insufficient to shift the burden, but nevertheless, the court could see from those affidavits what had happened. And then the bank brought the live witness to the evidentiary hearing and met Mr. Casper wasn't there to testify. So the trial court was uh, correct in concluding that the burden hadn't shifted, uh, but even if the court had tried to go beyond that, the defendants failed to carry the burden of bringing any evidence forward. Affidavits are not evidence at an evidentiary hearing, and therefore uh, the, the trial court was correct in determining that it could move forward with the summary judgment hearing uh, based on that note being an original or the defendants having failed to prove otherwise. I don't know whether the notice for this evidentiary hearing is in the record, but I'm, I'm just curious as to, was it the, the judge's decision to have the evidentiary hearing or was it something promoted by Fredham Simmons or how did this happen? Uh, the first time the motion for summary judgment was set for hearing, Your Honor, and, and was heard, uh, the judge who heard the first effort by the bank to obtain summary judgment denied that motion and said, set it for an evidentiary hearing on this limited issue. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not sure that we have a transcript in the record of that hearing. We just have it was the, it was the, what the followed. judge that wanted it set for that and it was set for that limited hearing. Yes, and that's actually discussed in the transcript that is filed from the um, evidentiary hearing and then the motion for summary judgment. The lawyers are explaining to the judge why they're there, because the judge is sort of saying, why is this in front of me? It had apparently been in front of a different judge earlier. Um, so the lawyers explain what I just said to the court as having happened. Um, I think that's at pages five and six. It's right up in the beginning of the transcript uh, where they basically say that the prior judge had said, set this down for a limited evidentiary hearing, let's resolve this issue, and then we can get to summary judgment if, if we clear this hurdle. I, uh, I didn't see anywhere in the briefing that once the Mr. Casper failed to show for the evidentiary hearing, no one attempted to have that hearing continued or rescheduled or 
there was no, no discussion of the fact that, gee whiz, you know, we were expecting him, but he can't make it or anything of that nature. Is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. There was no request for a continuance or uh, an extension on any kind of basis like that. Um, counsel for the defendants did make a reference to the fact that they wanted to have a trial on the issue. Um, I think there might have been some confusion as to what uh, on the part of the defense on what the purpose of the evidentiary hearing was. But in, in any event, the court explained and went forward and concluded that it, the burden had not shifted to the plaintiff and then went through the summary judgment hearing and entered the judgment. Now on appeal, the defendants have confined themselves to this one issue and alleged that because they claim there was an issue of fact as to whether the note was an original, that means there was an issue of fact as to whether the bank was entitled to summary judgment, uh, both because you have to show that you're the holder of the original note and because it's a matter of standing. So that's literally the only issue before the court it resolves both uh, of the issues raised in the brief. And we respectfully submit that the trial court was abundantly correct because the case law, you know, the, the Haycock case is out of the fifth, uh, fifth District in 1981. It's been around for a while and it tells us that uh, notes are in effect um, prima facie evidence of, of uh, their validity and it's up to the defense to meet the burden to challenge that. And then we cited the Progressive versus Gomez case. It's a circuit court appeal. You don't see too many of those published, um, but it had a nice uh, section on conclusory and self-serving affidavits uh, where the court said, and I just thought this sentence was kind of right on point, that opinion without more is no substitute for proof. And the circuit court judge there um, cite some of the District Court of Appeal decisions from this district and others that talk about what is and what is not sufficient in an affidavit, all of which goes back to the idea that a conclusory statement without more is insufficient to um, create a disputed issue of material fact and that statements of opinion without the substance on which uh, those opinions can be based and credited or without supporting facts are insufficient. And here that's all the trial court had before it was a conclusory self-serving affidavit that was insufficient to shift the burden. So we respectfully request that the court affirm the judgment that was entered below. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Peacock. Again, we, with respect to the, um, court or to the plaintiff. The issue here is also one of to hold against us, to hold the, to uphold the trial court's decision would effectively eviscerate the standing rule that says that if an issue of fact is raised sufficient to give a summary judgment judge pause, at that point the plaintiff should have to go to trial. All plaintiffs would have to do is then half notice evidentiary hearings which don't hold the same burden, don't hold the same weight, um, put one party or another potentially at a disadvantage. And I would point out the fact, fact pattern that happened here where there was an affidavit that again has not been supported by the my opposing counsel's own admission here today based on this person's review of an understanding of procedures and documents and things that were not attached to the affidavit. Again, a conclusory self-serving statement. But, you know, you have a client who apparently went to the courthouse and in, 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 in the span of a few minutes got to take a look at this document and because he may have worked at a print factory at, a, at an office depot or something has de decided that this note is not original and has, has prepared a very brief affidavit on that. It, you had ample opportunity before a noticed evidentiary hearing that the trial judge wanted set to bring in a real expert to look at the document and say, yes, indeed, this thing is not an original. You didn't do that. And I'm having a hard time with the notion that, that just because I worked in a printing shop makes me an expert as well as the, the party defendant to create a genuine issue. And I'm also having hard, I mean, I've always understood that a trial court had 
the authority under the rules of civil procedure to, to sever off a narrow issue that will otherwise be dispositive of the case and set it for a, a separate mini trial so that we don't use full resources of a full trial to, to resolve a matter that can be done in half an hour. Well, then by those issues, the decision in Judy, where the issue was over one narrow issue of whether or not a letter was applicable, could have been resolved without the necessity of a trial or even going back. The court could have made a decision this doesn't comply and out it goes. Um, my basic con problem is, is that this wasn't a mini trial. I don't believe any admissible evidence was put forward. There was, the mere fact that there was a requirement for an evidentiary trial means that at some point they found the evidence put forward by my client to be sufficient that- You didn't put on any evidence at all at the evidentiary hearing. We still have the affidavit. And we are contending that their affidavits, which were presented effectively at the summary judgment article before. If the judge- You knew that it was set for an evidentiary hearing by a judge and you didn't bring witnesses to an evidentiary hearing. We didn't know they were going to bring a witness until two days before. Was it set as an evidentiary hearing? It was, but we didn't know what evidence they were gonna have to counter our already established evidence. So that becomes an issue, which is if we're going for an evidentiary hearing, they don't list a witness as part of the notice of it. And then within a brief period before they suddenly show up with a witness. If their only evidence is an affidavit, which is by, it's by Israeli standards, completely inadmissible, so, and our point is it was sufficient enough to be an issue of fact to deny it at summary judgment. There was no evidence. That means at that point, this argument about whether or not it was an issue of fact was admitted to. Otherwise, the trial, the summary judgment judge could have said the same issue right then and there. This doesn't raise issue of fact. He chose not to. After hearing the full arguments, therefore, after that point. How much time was there between the original summary judgment hearing and the evidentiary hearing? I would say a few, a couple of months. It was not an excessively long time, but it was not an excessively short time either. Okay. However, my contention is logically set out, which is that at summary judgment, judge said there's an issue of fact here such that I can't grant you summary judgment. Plaintiff presumes no evidence until two days before where they suddenly shot him at a witness, which by the mini, if this, if we're going to call this a mini trial, let's treat it like a mini trial. The witness should have been excluded. That scintilla has not been overcome. And thus, we still had evidence the plaintiff did not overcome at trial. Mini trial, evidentiary hearing, however you care to put it. So by that standard, then the judge's ruling is clearly wrong as there was no admissible evidence to contradict my client's statement. Now the court can look at this de novo, of course, and make their own ruling as to the sufficiency of that affidavit. However, I'm pointing out that the trier of fact originally, who is the best, then we're back to an abuse of discretion standard because the trial, the summary judgment judge determined it was an issue of fact. And thus, triggering the burden to shift. With that, I thank your honors. Thank you. Next case is Hardy versus Shelley.